State Senator Kathleen Vinout of Alma has represented the 31st Senate District since 2007, but she said this week she's a Democratic candidate for governor, so we're thankful that the senator came in to talk about that. Senator, thanks for stopping in. My pleasure. Good to um, be here. Well, you joined four or five others, which we'll get to in a little bit. I watched your YouTube announcement. More than a third of it was devoted to health care. Is that your top issue? Yeah, well, that's always been my top issue. Yeah. It's been my top issue since before I ever thought about becoming a senator. It's what brought me to the Senate. So, yes, absolutely. As you say on there, you, your family, you and your husband and, and son didn't have health care. For a, a time, yes. And that's and why you ran in 2006. Well, and, and also for all of the farmers and small business people around me that were either paying way too much for health care or couldn't get it couldn't get it in a way that they could pay for it. It was just out of out of range. And it's it's we're we're kind of back ten years later having some of the same discussions about what the problems are. Haven't we gone forward as a nation with uh, Obamacare? We have. We have. We have not gone forward as much as I would like to in Wisconsin, and there are a number of things Wisconsin could do right away to improve our, our problems here, um, or to improve on making things more affordable. One of the bills I've introduced four different times I wrote as Obamacare was passing was to create a statewide marketplace. Yep, that's in your video. It's, it's something that would give us as a state more flexibility. We could create something that's uniquely ours. It, builds on the resources we already have here. It would help um, empower the, uh, the Commissioner of Insurance to hold down premiums. It would also give us an opportunity to move forward in some of the other reforms I'd like to see. For example, we need some type of a, what I would call, and some folks in Congress are calling, an invisible reinsurance. Um, so you might think of it as an invisible high-risk pool. If, if health care is all about sharing the risk, the idea is that you would share the risk among insurance companies for people who are really sick. If we had thought about this, you and I, we're going to cover 250,000 more people in Wisconsin, and those people haven't had insurance. If we were sitting having coffee, we would have thought, oh, they're going to be sick. I lived through this. My dad didn't have insurance for 10 years. And then he got on Medicare, and he had a lot of problems, and it was very expensive. And at that point, the costs go way up, and we all share those increased costs. But what happens eventually is the person's chronic disease gets under control. They end up getting the meds they need, the diet they need, the et cetera, or like what eventually happened to my dad, they pass on. And then they're not part of the pool anymore. So uh, eventually the costs are gonna stabilize. As we bring more people in and, and those people get their own health care stabilized, the costs are gonna stabilize. Would your marketplace be in tandem with seeking the expansion under Obamacare? A because yes. uh, Okay, so you would do two things. You would have At Wisconsin, uh, uh, more than two, <laughs> yes, but more than you, would, two. Uh, you would start by having, I would having, start with two. You would yes. start by having Wisconsin apply for, yes. the, for the MA expansion. Yes. And then what that would lay the groundwork for Wisconsin to set up its own marketplace. And we could do them, we could them do them divisibly so the, so the new governor could decide to accept the Medicaid expansion money and make the expansion. And then the legislature would have to empower the administration to, to have, to create their own marketplace. So, so we need partners, especially with passing the bill that I have out there, we need partners in the legislature to help get that done. What about the uncertainty of Washington money? to be there to expand MA to any state that is not now doing it, like Wisconsin. That's, that, that's an uncertainty. Absolutely, absolutely. So and, how, and how would you backfill that? It's, it's, a, it's a really good question. And when I think about the governor's argument that he didn't want to expand Medicaid because he was, uh, he was worried about the uncertainty, and then there's all this uncertainty. He didn't think the federal government was good for the money. Well, but here's the thing, Steve. We have had Medicaid since 1965. And frankly, you know, anybody who looks at the budget knows a third, almost a third of the entire all funds budget is health care. The vast majority of that, 90% of it is Medicaid. So we could not function as a state, nor could any other state 
function as a state if Medicaid went away. One in five people in this state right. take advantage of somehow some part of Medicaid. And, and the, 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 the prejudice is that they are poor women who are unmarried and have children. But the vast majority of it, two thirds of it, are people with long-term care. They're, they're grandma. They're people that have uh, disabilities. They're people that we think of as, as the least among us, in addition to the people who don't have means. And that would go away. There's no way that the federal government is gonna kick out um, all of these people out of nursing home and, and watch Badger Care and Senior Care and Family Care collapse, which is what would happen if the federal government pulled the plug. You want Wisconsin to take more, to build its own health care system, correct? That's correct. Isn't that kind of almost like what Senators Cassidy and Graham just almost got the Senate to vote on this week? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's hard to say that I ever agree with Republicans. On rare occasions, I do. I do not in this particular case. I understand. Because and they I were will gonna, tell you why. Because they were going to cut M.A. Right. And a governor That's buying... And, then, and there would be hundreds of thousands of people that would lose their health insurance under that and plan. Governor, that kept changing, mind you. And any budget submitted by a Governor Beinhout would not cut M.A. Uh, well, fair, fair here's... Statement? Here, no. Uh, oh, let me amend it please. slightly. Okay. Because here's where we do need to cut. I have for quite a long time been watching the increased dollars go to private corporations who administer the Medicaid program. Just in this past budget that passed last week, there was a fiscal bureau paper about the contracts that showed that if the state brought some of that administration in-house, we could save 30 percent. So People say Medicaid costs are out of control. Unsustainable. And unsustainable, you right. Like the transportation budget. Unsustainable. What Which are we going to we'll do? Which we'll get to in a minute. Go what ahead. Are, <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, first of all, we need, we need to look for efficiencies in the system. And those efficiencies are, are right within the employees that we have working for the Department of Health now. There's, there's so much that could be done to bring in-house and not pay for the profits of these other companies. And this goes all the way back to an audit that was done in 2011 which showed that so much was being outsourced that the administration couldn't say with certainty how much money the state was spending on the individual parts of Medicaid, on family care, on, on Badger care, on senior care. And, and when the department came to testify before us and we said, we need to tighten up this law, you guys need to be accountable for the dollars that you're spending and spending and spending and don't have legislative o oversight over this, they said, we don't want to change it because we want the flexibility to move it from one program to another to another. That is not helping the public see in to the largest program in state government. Do you still believe, as, you're, as you got your caucus to buy into in 2007, in a universal health care system, Let's both for a state and a nation? Yes, you I do. believe in health care for all, and I will work and do everything I can to make sure that everyone has access to affordable health care, and there are several steps that the state can take to move us in that direction. Um, okay, now let's move to transportation. A Governor Weinhout budget would pay for long-term transportation. How? There are a lot of options on the table. And which and ones do you like? Well, I, I can tell you. Um, one of my favorite is not my idea. It's an idea of the former secretary. He put together a 600-page budget with 24 different revenue uppers or, or options. Options. And, and I read through the whole thing, and I was fascinated to learn that the state owns 624 miles of rail. I knew that, but most people don't. Most people did not, and your senator was one of them. And I, I learned this about two and a half years ago, and I took this idea back to my constituent uh, constituents, and I said, what do you think of the secretary? Remember now, the secretary was appointed by Governor Walker. His idea is to say, let's tax every car that travels on this state-owned road ten dollars as they travel on our state-owned rail ten dollars a car it's a meager fee but it makes a big difference in the long run because all of the what, what i learned from the fiscal bureau is eighty percent of the maintenance on th that track yeah. is funded by borrowing borrowing and paid for with the taxpayers how much would that raise 
Well, it, <laughs> would it raise would it enough to get us through it? Would it but pay it, for the the, the north south zoo freeway repairs? The busiest but intersection. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't cover that much. I'm sorry. Fini but it, finish but your it, transportation. <laughs> it would. <laughs> it, it would. It would at least get off of the table, and it, it's varied from year to year. So I'll say it's between looking, depending on the budget you look at, it's between 24 and 48 million dollars in the biennium. So it's two over, years. Over two 12, years. Between 12 and and, and 24 right. in, annually. Right. That's additional borrowing. So we have a big problem in the transportation fund. We can, what we can pay for what we're buying. We, the state is, can borrow and, and pay for it later, or we cannot do it, and what happens? We pay for it, you and me, when we hit that pothole and need another front end. Okay, but let's go through three options. Do you support tolling down the line, potentially? I don't like tolling. You don't like tolling? No, I don't like tolling. The gas tax hasn't been raised since 2006. I, is, should it go up? Yes. How many pennies? Well, it should go. My proposal is to send it up five pennies. If we kept the indexing from 2006, we would be at about six and a half pennies. Um, this raises about $350 million. It gets us about the third of the way that we need to. And there's some discussion about what that number is. You know, Fiscal Bureau has given a lot of different, you know, say, well, a billion dollars. No, maybe it's $950 million, But it gets us about a third of the way. What about the registration fee, the $75? We, yes, we need to change the registration fee. Before, before it became popular, I was, I was advocating in the last budget that we tie the registration fee to the value of the car, which is something Minnesota does, but that we also add a modest fee for hybrids and, and, and um, electric vehicles. In full disclosure, I, I drive a Ford hybrid. But the idea that the that the budget committee this year has gone to, which is to say the only people that are going to see an increase are the hybrid owners and the electric car owners, I am totally opposed to. But that's to pay the debt service on the $402 yes. million in bonding. Yes. And I'm not I, trying to lead you on. No, I'm, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I'm seeing that you read some of the same papers that I read. Well, <laughs> you and I have a tendency to be wonks. So we how do totally we explain do. this? But so I can tell you a simple little way to explain it. We, we have a problem, and the Finance Committee got us through this problem, and they did it through a lot of one-time funds that are not going to be there in the next budget, which means the next budget mi makers are going to have the same problem these budget makers did. So one of the things they did was they played with inflation. So you probably read the audit, the great big audit on the Department of Transportation by the Legislative Audit Bureau. There's a big disconnect between what was being proposed and what was actually being spent. Nobody went back in the legislature and said, how much is this whole program costing us, not just this year's or this budget's worth? And the, one of the big issues was they didn't adequately estimate inflation. So that's so, for so audit committee members. We had, to, we had members? to pass a law saying, <laughs> going forth, thou shalt right. DOT estimate inflation. But to balance the transportation budget, the Department of Transportation went back under that law and re-estimated lower the inflation going forward. And if that's not playing with the books, I, I don't know what is. So they found, you know, 26 million here, 40 million there, and all of a sudden the transportation budget is balanced. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not good. This is not solving the problem. Well, I asked the Fiscal Bureau about the structural deficit in, 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 in the transportation fund. And they said, in the, it, we're looking here in the next biennium, 1921, and they estimated about 93 million. But I want to move on to a different subject. So that, just, just as a data point, that night, that you said ninety three nine nine no, no ninety three million ninety three million okay. okay that's the estimated structural at Wistat my source on that is fiscal bureau but I want to go to a different subject okay go this for year it. Um, uh, we're K twelve state aid is totaling thirty two percent how much would state thirty two percent of general fund yeah yeah thirty two percent of general of, fund not uh, the total budget well thirty two percent my understanding K twelve spending is coming from the general fund. Yeah. What would it be in a Governor Reinhardt budget? Well, th this is, again, a Fiscal Bureau question. And the question is whether or not you include the school levy tax credit That's true. in that amount. Which holds down your property tax bill and mine. Right. But so does spending on schools. So does spending on schools. So 
what what I propose is is a an idea that's been around in 2011 and so forth, all these other budgets, the alternative budgets that I wrote, what I proposed is to say, let's take the school levy tax credit, put it into equalized aid, hold every school harmless, so no school gets less money under the new formula, bring up a foundation of about $3,000 per student, so every school gets a basic foundation from, you know, Washington Island to Walworth to... Mequon. Mequon, right. Everybody gets a basic foundation and then change, th put the equalized aid formula on top of that and change it so that it recognizes some of the problems that schools see in the way they do their budget. For example, it costs more to educate a child in poverty. M many, many studies show us that. Superintendent Evers' budget has reflected that. Right. So, well, his budget, but not that that was introduced by the governor. I understand. The governor rejected There's a disconnect there. vast majority of the, I of the ideas that Superintendent Evers put into his own budget. Vast majority of ideas of changing the formula. He, t he took some of them, like high cost transportation aid he took. But the, you know how proud the governor is of the upper 639 okay. million over two. Yes, and, and, and the frustration I have with the governor is that he could have fixed the formula with that money. And instead, he chose to put it outside the formula, making the inequities in the state worse. When you go up 200 year one, 204 year two, yes. you're building, you're continuing you're, inequities. You're, you're That's making your argument, not mine. It, but. It, you're making the inequities worse. Well, it, it's, it, you can say it's not, it's my argument, not yours, but it's basic math. The whole idea of the equalized aid formula is to equalize the, the values of property so that if you have low value property, you get more aid, high value property, you get less aid. Well, we all know basing it on property is not a good idea because property doesn't equate to wealth anymore. But we have this property tax. We've all been trying to figure out how to get lower. But the, way, the best way to get it lower and to sustain it over the long range is to put money in it to equalize aid and, and to fix the formula. And you know who did this? Who I respect? Governor Thompson. Republican Governor Thompson did this in the late, in the 19, later 1996, 97, 98. And what we saw is that the property tax actually fell by three and a half percent. So the governor likes to say we're lowering property tax, but he doesn't mention we're lowering the increase. So it used to go this way, now it's going this way, but it's still going up. What Tommy Thompson did when he put money into schools, a billion into schools, he actually dropped it. He dropped it two budgets, two years in a row. And we have to sustain that if we are really going to get to the solution Kay. to fix schools. But we so have a whole bunch we have sorry. a bunch of subjects to go through. Oh. Um, we have a bunch of stuff to go through, that's for sure. A bunch, a bunch of issues. <laughs> yes. If you're governor, do you want to cancel or renegotiate the Foxconn deal? That's a question you need to ask Governor Walker, because I cannot see that contract. I have no idea but if I became governor, if I had the power to renegotiate it, Wiedig or if there's an opt-out clause. The Weedig board, as we speak, is, meet, is scheduled to meet as we speak. in closed session yes. to draft a contract, yes. which would then be presented to Foxconn. Yes. So until Foxconn accept it, accepts it, you and I don't know. You're right. We don't know what's we in it. We don't have any idea. Okay. Basically, so the legislature bought a pig in a poke. We have, which for the non-farm listeners that you have, that's a pig in a black bag, and we have no idea if we can even poke the pig and find out if it squeals. Okay. So you're reserving judgment on what you do until you can I see I want to see the details. I want to see the power that the next governor has to be able to protect the taxpayers of Wisconsin. Okay, new subject: free tuition at community colleges at, so at the at, at the two year at two year tech two year UW, UW campuses and tech colleges. Have you seen the price tag on yes, that? How I would have. you pay? Okay, uh, okay, uh, Senator Wonk, how much would it cost? <laughs> I have a bill coming out to do just this, okay. and it is a fully funded bill using dollars in the same budget. And then do you come up with that dollars by changes in the tax code? If so, what changes in the tax code? Well, I, t I come up with it by changing the tax credit, one single tax credit. So there are 43 different tax credits. Well, actually, 44 when Foxconn passed a couple weeks ago. Okay. So I take one of those tax credits, and I lower the rate a little bit so that they don't get as much of a break as they used to. And that's how I pay for it. I have businesses in Eau Claire who are saying to me, I don't have workers. I can't expand. I don't have trained workforce. And we have 
company here and a company here who are paying nothing in taxes. This doesn't make any sense, Steve. It makes sense for the entire state to say, let's educate our workforce. We have a wage problem in Wisconsin. We're ranked 18th lowest of wages in the state, in the country, lower than Tennessee, who actually came up with this idea. I didn't take this idea out of my head. I took it by reading. I read about what was happening in Tennessee. Republican governor of Tennessee said, we have a problem. Our people are not educated, our, work, our businesses don't, don't have the workers, and our wages are too low. We're going to fix it. And they did. What would you do to the manufacturing and ag tax credit? That's exactly where I would take the money from. Do you zero from. that? No, I don't even have to. You dial it back? Because it's so big. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. And so that's where you would get the money for free one tuition. Single a, credit, one, yes. one single one tax credit, yes. A portion, credit. a portion of a tax credit. That's how much money is going out the door. Of taxpayer money is going out the door so that Company X pays nothing in taxes, even though Company X still hires the educated kids that got educated at the public school. They still drive on the roads. They still need police protection and fire protection. And they're not paying anything in taxes. What would the first budget do to the choice program, Senator? Well, Governor? Well, what I would very much like to do is to eliminate the statewide expansion, and that money I took when I wrote my alternative budget. You dial it back just to Milwaukee and Racine? Right. Okay. And, and not increase it at all. Okay. So keep it frozen. Keep it right where dial it is. Dial it back. Yes. Dial it back Get and keep it where it is. Get rid of the statewide expansion, yes. No, no longer ex expand yes. it. Yes. Okay. Um, Wisconsin incarcerates more African Americans than any other state. How would you break that pattern as governor? I would break that pattern, first of all, by investing in alternatives to incarceration. So a great, another great budget example, to fully fund what's called the TAD grant, Treatment Alternatives and Diversions, to fully fund that program that says to a person who has an addiction and is about to face a felony charge, if you comply with this program, if you stay with this program, you, here's our carrot, you won't have a felony charge and you won't end up in prison. If you screw up, and, and don't stay clean, you're going to prison. It's, it's absolutely criminal for the, for the Republicans, for the legislature, to not fully fund that program. It's extremely effective. And one of my own counties had their grant funding cut. A county that has one of the highest per capita out of home child placements because of the problems of addiction in that county. Buffalo, Trimpolo? It's Jackson. Jackson. Very sad. Now, we just wrote another uh, application, and I very much hope that they're going to get funded now. But they went for a period of time with a full up and running program with no, with when the state didn't have the money, they dialed back, and they dialed back in a place where they really needed. So $20 million out of a $76 budget, billion dollar budget, this is a... But this is this is change on the floor. You know, twenty million dollars we could fully fund this program every county all across the state, and that's just the beginning. So we take the Medicaid money, which frees up about two hundred and eighty-six million in cash because basically the feds will pay for what the state's already paying for for health care. If the feds are good for it, go well, ahead. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's that well, whole well, Washington well, debate, you're, Senator. You're, it's definitely, <laughs> but after okay. we get through the 30th, hopefully that'll be not an issue anymore. All right. But then, but then we take that money, and I'm only taking 74 um, million of it, which you know only about 44 million in general funds because it's matching money, and invest it in community-based mental health crisis and, and um, a, a locally run addiction substance abuse treatment facilities. So to go back to your question about African Americans and incarceration, mm -hmm. we can also look at the bigger incarceration picture, although that is a very serious problem. The bigger picture is that Minnesota incarcerates about half of the people that Wisconsin does. And with about uh, the same crime rate, a similar population, similar you know, big city rural issues. And what they did back in the 1970s was to create a community-based mental health and addiction treatment system. Uh, right now I'm hearing from my counties and they're saying, we have somebody who's addicted to meth and mentally ill, and the law enforcement tells me this is a, a wicked combination, that they become extremely violent, and there's no crisis facility. There's no beds. There, the poorer county, um, and this was Buffalo, used almost 
its entire budget in 2017 to transport people to medicine to Mendota in the first two months. So you you would originally treat that? Yes, yes, yes. I, I have to ask you the same question I ask all uh, Democrats once they declare. Act 10, would your budget try to reverse all provisions of Act 10 or just part of it? How would you respond to Act 10? The main problem with Act 10 is dealing the, with the fallout of the bomb. So the governor, and clearly, went to punish teachers and public employees, and he did. And look at the fallout. Look at what's happened. We have schools that can't find teachers. The finding a teacher is kind of for a superintendent and a school board, like the NFL draft. We, we just went through it. My husband's on the school board, and he had a husband came and negotiated, you know, school A, school B, school C, what will you give me? Well, teacher took school C, which happened to be in Wabasha, Minnesota. What does that do for a small rural school? Uh, would you restore the collective bargaining rights that I, If I had away? the votes, it does need to be done in okay. a different bill. But think about, Steve, think about all the problems that have happened. We've got people not going into the field of education. We've got um, professors taking their grants and leaving. We've got, we're going to have an audit hearing on the veterans' homes in the next week or so. Big finding that came out of that audit. What did it say? Problems with overtime, problems with short staffing, problems with positions that couldn't be filled. We have a state government that is not running at full throttle because we can't get and keep good people because of the fallout of Act 10. Okay. And the next governor, Democrat or Republican, is going to have to deal with that. How are you going to separate yourself from the four major announced candidates, Mr. Evers, Walks, Gronick, uh, et, et cetera, Mr. McCabe? Why are you more qualified? I have a, a very different background than anybody else that's in the race. I kind of, I got involved middle age. I was 48 when I ran. I had several different careers before then. I spent my first 10 years working in healthcare, my second 10 years teaching at a university, talk, teaching healthcare. Then I left and became a full-time dairy farmer. I spent um, a lot of time in, in those years that I was thinking about running for Senate, basically working with farmers, trying to figure out how to get affordable health care. And it was that work that led me to become involved in the Senate. Since I've been in the Senate, I focused on, well, certainly agriculture and higher education, but uh, mostly on the audit committee. I've gotten my hands dirty in trying to figure out what's wrong with state programs, trying to fix them. I've written four alternatives to the governor's budget showing that we can put people first in our policies, in the t make people the top priority in, s in state decisions, using the same amount of money in the budget. You didn't I don't think there's anybody else that can say that. You didn't win the 2012 recall primary. How are you going to win the next August primary? <laughs> well, the, the, Going back to what the themes that you just outlined? Well, absolutely. Putting people first, making people the top priority, making certain that the policies and the c candidate that I am, that I embody in every day that I'm on the campaign trail, talk, I talk about things that matter, things that make a difference in people's lives, okay. and show the how. It's not an empty promise. Here's how you get it done. You want to talk details? I got details. Um, okay, we're almost out of time. Two final questions. Uh, is, this, is this primary going to boil down to money? Are you going to be outspent in the primary? Uh, if the governor is going to be able to raise 15 or 20 million, how are you going to compete, Senator? I'm not afraid of big money. And I believe raising in it? I, I'm uh, not afraid of running against it or raising it. Okay. But pu putting people first is how the Democrats win. Far too long, insiders have put all of their faith in money. But our winning strategy as Democrats is to embody our slogan, to be the party of the people, which means in campaigns and in the Capitol, to make sure that what we do when we're running is engaging the grassroots, growing the grassroots, nurturing them, helping people run the kind of campaign in their neighborhood that gets people engaged and excited. Okay, I want to ask you to two, uh, respond to two statements by the Republican Party. When you announced, they said, quote, this is their quote, Vinehout's tax and spend agenda will uh, take Wisconsin backwards. Quick response, because we're almost out of time. They're referring to health care. And let's talk about health care. I can't wait to talk about health care. Okay. 
And then today it's timely because the Republican Party saying you used poor judgment when you wrote the character reference for the former legislative attorney who was convicted of possession of child pornography. Quick response? <laughs> my quick response is I was asked to write the letter and my mom taught me to hate the sin but not to shun the sinner. If people want more details, they can go to the Capital Times website. Okay. Okay. So you're in and you're I'm in, in and uh, you have to give up your Senate seat and I you're do. ready to do that. I absolutely. Okay. Senator Kathleen Vinell, thank you for coming in. <laughs> Always appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.